six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at two thirteen. Prepare yourself for a world of seriousness. This is seriousness. What is going on, everybody? It's time for the Science Night, Saturday, 10 a.m. All the nights are assembled. We have Dr. Sean Graham, Dr. Thomas Schiller over here in the house, and all the way from India. We have Dr. Honorbon Bhattacharji. What's up, Honorbon? Nothing much. Well, yeah, I can hear all of you loud and clear. So, yeah, nothing much. It's the same thing. Quarantine is going on. So, yeah. And we have, uh, we are, go- like, wearing a mask in public places. is mandatory. So, yeah. So, and right. nobody's... And when are you coming home, place. man? When are you coming home? Um... I'm 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 waiting for things to clear up and flights to get regularized. So um, maybe a couple of months, hopefully. Oh man, right. man! So, well, when you come home, uh, we're gonna throw a big party for you, buddy. That's right. Yeah, I just don't want to come home and get sick again. <laughs> well, right. okay. So today we are talking about something that I personally love to do. I know you all love to do because you like to be out and about in the field and. Uh, you know, feel the earth with your bare hands, maybe even catch a snake or two, you know, catch some wildlife or just observe it is hiking and the wonders of hiking, because you can really uh, discover a lot if you're out there in the middle of nowhere and uh, just experiencing uh, the world as it is naturally. Right. That's right. And, and I think we're going to talk a little bit today about um, where we can hike right but there's different levels of hiking here so you have those folks that can't really hike a lot they're novices uh they don't have a lot of experience in hiking maybe they want to get into hiking and then you have those folks that have been hiking but want to take it to the next level sure and then you have those real extreme experts and i've been on a few days trip uh hiking in my past uh with my dad and uh, man, that I mean, you're talking about caching your water, like you know, caching yeah. food, especially like, out here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, water is the big thing, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Can, so um, can, can we admit something here though at the beginning? Yeah. So we might we're recording this in advance, so we're we're hoping that as we record this, that in maybe two or three weeks, the national and state parks have opened up again. Yeah. Well, they are open. The state parks, well, the state parks are yeah. opened up uh, as we're recording this. I think the national park is still got its doors closed. But hopefully, uh, you know, by the time you guys hear this, the national park will be open too, and then uh, our recommendations are going to be good for that. But um, yeah, I've got a little bit of experience hiking in the in the state park as well. Um, so we can we can maybe give them a little bit of uh, talk about some experiences they could have in both places. Um, sure. But you know, the creme de la creme, of course, is the national park. Yeah. It's got the best trails. Oh yeah, it's for got sure. One hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, is it more vast than the state park? You know, that's a really good question. It's, um, it's. I think it is bigger. It's yeah. the biggest one down there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So here's here's my general recommendation or or observation about the state park compared to the national park. If you want to to hike on a trail that's really well established and if you get into trouble or if you're kind of kind of hesitant to go out and hike by yourself, the national park is the place to go. The state park is so incredibly remote that if you get into trouble, you're going to be in, in trouble. That's not to dissuade people from going out there, but it is more remote and you have to take precautions if you go to the state park. Not for the whole state park. That you know, the, the state park kind of extends across the, the road that goes between Terralingua and, and Presidio. So there are hikes that you can do close to the main road where you probably wouldn't get in any trouble. But if you go to the main area of the Big Bend mm-hmm. Ranch State Park, 
it's out there, man. It's, yeah. It's remote. And a lot of people might be looking for something like that. Like on a day when the, uh, the national park is super busy, like a spring break kind of weekend or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's impossible. At, you yeah. might just, uh, if you got experience and you know Big Bend real well and you're pretty experienced hiking, uh, yeah, maybe give yeah. the state park a try that weekend because you, you will so, definitely not see the same amount of people at the state park. What's up, Underbond? So Big Bend uh, National Park has like 800,000 acres of land. While the Big Bend, uh, the state park has around 300,000 acres of land. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. So that's a big difference. Yeah. 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 Hey, Honorbon, can... before we get into uh, our local parts here in the Alpine, since you can't, like, you know, come out here right now and we miss you and we can't wait until you come back, but are there any uh, parks out there in India that you would uh, want to take a day trip on? Mm, the closest one is the Sundarbans, like which is the mangrove forest, which has Royal Bengal tiger in them, for a, to to my place. So you can take an overnight trip. But uh, here's the thing about India is that like, most forests are not open for hiking, so you can't just go into a forest and go hiking. So there are very uh, there are places where you can go hiking, but uh, those are not inside a forest, like. The, they're not allowed. Yeah, and there there are Bengal tigers, which we've yeah. got yeah. we've got so, black bears, like and, a Bengal tiger, <laughs> a, a bang, the a, Bengal tiger, the, the, the one the Bengal over there, tigers. the Bengals. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. what what about you, Conley? What what's your preference? You've been out here in West. I, I really so. personally, I like the Guadalupes. I, okay. I like all of them. I mean, Big Bend National Park. I have a year pass to uh, every single year of my existence. I'll never not renew it every year. I like um, uh, CDRI too. Yeah. Um, Chihuahuan Desert Research Institute has some really good like daily hikes that you can yeah. take. And those are more along the lines of take your friends and family out there for a day, have mm -hmm. a picnic, bring some like sandwiches or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, th that's nice. And yeah. You know, Fort Davis has uh, all those beautiful cottonwood trees and whatnot. But in Big Ben, I've I've taken families from the big city metroplex out there that have paid me to go and give them tours and and do photography for them uh, and, and their family and whatnot. And it's really interesting because they have never experienced it. And I've experienced it so much. I guess I kind of have a different appreciation for it than they do. You know, th those folks that are from the big city that come out and look at it maybe for the first time that aren't accustomed to how majestic it is. Yeah. And that's my job to try to bring that majesty, bring that uh, mysticism of the high desert like to them. Yeah. Right. That's that's one of my goals with my geology classes, especially my introductory class to geology. I get a lot of students who they, they could have been here in Alpine for two years or maybe even three years and never have never been down yeah. in the national park. And the, the biggest shock to them is that we have mountains in Texas. We have true mountains. Like we have the Guads, which are true mountains. And we have, we have Big Ben, the Chizos Mountains. And every time I, I take students down there, and I do this almost every semester, it's a really great experience for me because I don't, I don't take my students on big, long, multi-mile hikes for my introductory classes, but I take them up to the Chizos Mountains, and I take them to Santa Elena Canyon, and I have these kids, or well, I shouldn't say kids, they're adults, that are from Houston, from the Metroplex, from right. Austin, San Antonio. Waiting and to have, go hang out at the club and whatnot. Yeah, and, and they have no clue that there are mountains, and they could be a variety of students. You know, you have you have hipster kids who are from Austin who've never been out here, but you have like inner city kids from Houston who yeah. have never been out to Big Bend. And they're just amazed by, by the resource that we have here. And I, I could, I'm, I'm not lying. I could, I could tell you, I have a handful of occasions. I've, I've got students who say they're going to come back down here to, to Big Bend with their buddies to go on a hike or something on their own time, which is great. And, and you made a good point, Conley, when it comes to the national park. There are so there's such a variety of, of trails and opportunities oh, yeah. that you can have people who are really novice hikers, people who have never been hiking a day in their life, 
or people who are experienced backpackers who can who can go out to Big Bend and depending on how much time they have can experience the park within a couple hours or within two or three days backpacking. Oh yeah, for um, sure. On really nice, well established, well kept hiking trails. Um, or if you're really hardcore, you can go out to the state park and you can hike for days. You can go out on and just roam around, or you can go mountain biking in, in the state park. You can go mountain biking. On the state park trip. is uh, a lot flatter than the national park, isn't it? Uh, depending on where you are, yeah. The, most yeah. of the state park is is relatively flat compared to the national park, but you get yeah. into the solitario, it gets. Oh, right. There's certainly yeah. some topography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there there's a lot of diversity out yeah. there too. Um, so that that brings me to a point here. Um, one reason why I like Guadalupe so much is like if you go in the like November months or even, you know, <laughs> it was crazy. We went uh, one summer and had snow out yeah. there at the Guadalupe uh, Mountains. Yeah, I've been there in April with, when with snow. Snowing, yeah, yeah it, it was amazing. Yeah, it's, and, a, it's a great park. And, and geologically speaking, it's really interesting and i was actually planning on talking about it for this this show well do you want to expand on that because sure. i mean i, I would sh uh, i would be i mean really interested in hearing about how the weather and its location geologically would affect its uh topography right yeah well so let me let me give you three since we're talking about trails i'll give you three trail options here okay for for the quads all right um so if you've never been out to, to the Guads, it's not the most popular park in the country. So uh, for, for all of our listeners that are listening from, you know, around the world and, you know, in, in the United States that might want to come out and check it out. Uh, the Guads are located in Texas, uh, really right near New Mexico, yeah, uh, right almost at the, the border. New Mexico border. Yeah. So. So there are places you can camp there. Um, and sometimes they, they, there aren't so many campsites. Sometimes they're full, but you can go to like White City, New Mexico, and camp there. Mm -hmm. um, Carlsbad Caverns is really close, so it's a great spot to spend maybe a long weekend, or you, you could you, you could spend a week there if you wanted to. But in terms of hiking trails, um, the three suggestions I have for for the Guads for the Guadalupe Mountains is okay. Let's start with the a novice trail, so McKittrick Canyon. Yep. It's, I think, maybe less than two miles. The big draw to McKittrick Canyon is, one, the geology, because you kind of see the, the lower sedimentary rocks that are exposed there. We're talking Permian. We're talking late Paleozoic sedimentary rocks that were deposited in a big reef that existed during that time. So if you do the McKittrick Canyon Trail, you can see all these reef rocks. But the big attraction there is to go during the fall because there are all these trees that are in their fall colors and it's gorgeous a lot of yellows yeah. oranges yellows, yeah. and yeah, uh, it's beautiful. Bunch really of oaks, beautiful and then there's uh, maple that's what's yeah. giving that that bright red in that canyon really yeah. really nice maples my dad and i went uh out there a few years ago and uh just it was absolutely amazing and my dad uh for those of you that might be questioning hey is mckittrick canyon a advanced level trail is it a novice trail well my dad is a very experienced hiker and he's you know in his 60s and uh he he took it like nothing i mean it was yeah. nothing to him it's, it's so pretty, it, it's would you say it was trail. a novice trail pretty i would say easy? so yeah yeah i mean just like anything you want to take plenty of water not like that. guadalupe peak right not like guadalupe peak that'll be my third <laughs> suggestion okay well so, go go ahead continue let with me, your let me second. go with my second and yeah. the second suggestion is my number one suggestion for everyone because this is the most geologically interesting the permian reef trail okay so the permian reef trail is not the most scenic trail in the guadalupe mountains but what you can do with the permian reef trail is you can go to the visitor center and you can get a a guidebook and along this trail i, I can't remember how many miles it is it's it's pretty strenuous it's not an easy hike but you can get a guidebook and it will show you at each one of these little little points that are numbered what you're looking at in terms of the Permian rocks. So you're basically you're basically going up, you're you're reading Earth's history from from the back forward. So you're going to the oldest rocks up to the youngest rocks. And there are fossils and all sorts of cool stuff that you can see as you hike up the trail. Yeah. 
Um, and when you get to the top, you basically get up into a pine forest. Pine and forest? Yeah. It's oh, yeah, forest yeah. That's mountain. what I've heard. Yeah. And you get a, a great view of, of all the low country around you down to the basin. Um, so it's, it's probably one of my favorite trails of all time. Uh, but the geology is really interesting. So it's one of these deals where the park has done a great job of of setting it up, setting it up so that you can teach yourself. You get one of these guidebooks, you can walk up the trail and you can learn about the Permian, you can learn about the reef, and you can actually see the stuff that they're describing. And it's a it's a pretty darn strenuous trail right yeah so so plan what, level, for a full what day. level would you uh, recommend like people that are in good health that have uh you know d done hiking a lot before would it, would um, it be somebody who is uh, starting out that wants to get better i would say moderate it's it's moderate? a moderate trail okay. you know in any case you can you take your time as long as you have plenty of water plenty to eat and you're, if you're with other people like i've i've seen 400 pound guys do this trail. Whoa. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You just got to take your time. You know. Um, Good for you, them. If, yeah. yeah. If if I've you, seen I've seen super out of shape people do fifteen miles. Super out of shape. People. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing yeah. what human endurance. You wouldn't. You, you think it's more mental? People don't give themselves enough credit. Well, I I think it is. I've seen people that are if perfectly you, you, in great shape. Yeah. And and I've climbed like I mean I mean I've, I don't know like six eight mile thing yeah and uh you know they're behind me like waiting and they're in better shape than i am and i'm like what yeah but but then you know when i'm out mentally and i, I don't feel like it you know i'm in that state too you know i get to where like oh i can't do this uh so yeah. that's one of my favorite things taking students out on hikes i do i take them on like 14 15 mile hikes on purpose even though i know we're not going to really see that much wildlife um, like during the middle of the day, it's hard to see many mammals. And I still take my mammalogy class on hikes that are 14 miles and it's not to see mammals. They mm -hmm. think, I tell them, oh, we got a chance of seeing, you know, all kinds of stuff, bears. I know we're not going to see anything. And they get back and they're like, that's the longest I've ever walked in my life. Are you serious? Yeah. Really? And I'm like, well, then, you know, that was success. That's, yeah. what, that's what I want. Well, if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you don't keep hiking, and, and I've known this, well, certainly because you, there yeah. there were there were spurts to where I was hiking all the time, every single day, every single month, you know, I would go out and I would take a hike, yeah. you know, and then I stopped for a while. I had a lull. Yeah. And man, getting back on that was a tough yeah. one. It was tough. Well, you have to think of it this way, you know, as humans, we're more made for for hiking long distances than we are for sitting on our butts for right. prolonged periods of time so yeah. even if you're even if you're a little bit out of shape especially if you're in a really scenic area or you're hiking on a trail where things are interesting you can compel yourself to keep going forward and i've seen it on multiple occasions i've seen like probably sean has too people who are incredibly out of shape who probably haven't walked a mile in five years who can do 10 or 15 miles yeah, they're. I mean, the next day they're hurting. Humans. Yeah, but it's all mental, pe though. I people, mean, it depends well, on people, what mental state you're we, in. Whenever we give you ourselves so much credit for our brains as yeah. humans, so it's it's all about our brains. But that is actually not. I don't think that brains are our number one survival um, adaptation. It's our endurance. Yeah, humans have incredible endurance for a mammal. There are very few mammals that could do the kinds of in, uh, feats of endurance that humans can. For example, I think they do this race every year. This is totally off topic, where they'll race horses, mm -hmm. but they race it, horses over a long distance. Okay. Of like you know fifty miles, and humans can beat a horse at, at that distance. Oh right, yeah. yeah. Well, because horses are trained to race well, they and just, sprint. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. yeah you can, right. Yeah, there are there, you know there are ancient tribesmen who can run down a gazelle over a sixteen mile race, and the gazelle will collapse. Wow! Uh, and then they can just knock it over the head with a rock. Was that in Born to Run? Yep, that's really? that's described in Born to Run. The book yeah. Born to Run, everybody. <laughs> uh, it will change your life. Honor Bond. Before we go to break, uh, what? trails have you walked or where have you gone to look at the stars out here in beautiful alpine texas Backyard. be a little nostalgic for me here backyard 
<laughs> oh, backyard. <laughs> like 17 feet? I can tell you exactly where he's gone to look at stars, because I've been with him every time. Harry, like, Harry right. Sanaa. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Harry Sanaa. Yeah. I know. What, I was Big Ben? Like, Ernst Sanaa. No, Harry Sanaa. Alpine, oh, Texas. Oh, yeah. oh, look at no. the sea stars. <laughs> yeah, like, if you with Alpine and the surrounding areas, if you, can, if you just get away from the town, you can just get clear nights, pretty much, clear skies. So, it's just so hard. Like that's a big, and you can just watch. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. so you haven't no, really like, went on uh, many hikes around here yet. No right. walking yeah. required. We get we got to get you yeah. out, Honor Bond. Yeah, we keep we keep trying to. We got to take a like a few day he, trip. He's still never been to Big Bend National Park. Oh my! I have been to Big Bend National Park. Took your other friends. That's right. My, I'm, yeah, sorry. I, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. That's right. Was it for a day trip? I forgot about that. Uh. So, no, yeah, we had to. We were planning to go camping, but every single campsite was like taken during that time. So yeah, you, you got to do it during like, the winter, man. Yeah, we'll get, we we'll get like, you down there on a bun. back to back. That was like driving back and forth three days in a row. <laughs> when you said Harry's Tanata, I was thinking uh, Ernst Tanaha over yeah. in Big Ben. Yeah, no, I was like, oh well, that's a yeah. good trail. That's a that's a good. Well, it's a good we'll trail, go but there. it doesn't have the rewards that. <laughs> Harry's <laughs> not. I don't know if you can find a coyote or two yeah, like uh, carry him out there. Yeah. You know. All right. Hey, we're going to go to break. And uh, when we get back, we're going to talk more about hiking. We're going to talk about how to prepare for these hikes, too, because uh, there's a lot of places out there. There are. Um, uh, I mean, you have to be prepared if you're not, then it could mean life or death. It really could. Yeah. So uh, stay tuned. We will be right back. All right, we're back. We're the Science Knights, and we're talking about hiking today. Um, we spent the first segment kind of talking about uh, a couple of our recommendations for hikes. We might get on that again here in a bit. But um, let me finish up with talking about the Guadalupe Mountains. So this is one of kind of, it's it's not the most popular park um, just because it's so remote, it's it's really a beautiful place, and there are great campsites and great hikes. And I talked about two hikes that I, I recommended here. One, which is kind of a, a beginner's hike, McKittrick Canyon. I talked about a, a moderate hike that's a really great geology hike. So let's finish up with, with talking about uh, the hike up to Guadalupe Peak. So Guadalupe Peak is one of the highest peaks in Texas. It's a mountain, so it's a true peak. Um, and it's it's pretty strenuous. It's a little bit more strenuous than the Permian Reef Trail, but the payoff is even greater. Not necessarily um, in terms of the geology, but the, the view that you get from up there. And you get to go up there and you get to sign the little book and say that you've been to one of the highest peaks in Texas. The highest peak in Texas. I signed it when I was six years old. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, you can see everything from there. From yeah, the top, beautiful. you can see the great big salt uh, pan out to the west. You can see the Oregon Mountains, the Franklin Mountains. To the north, you can see the Sacramento's in New Mexico. Yeah, on a clear day. And I'll give you a quick little, uh, I'll throw a bone. If, when you're going up there, a biology bone, I guess. Uh, when you're on your way up to Guadalupe Peak, the first pine forest you encounter, look for chipmunks. <laughs> The, it's the only like place. Like Alvin and uh, yeah. Theodore. Theodore. And, it's, yeah. not, it's more exciting than that. Cause Simon. It's, it's the only place in Texas where you can see chipmunks. Uh, mm -hmm. There's only one species of chipmunk in Texas, and it's in Guadalupe Mountains. It's what gray, is that species? Gray-footed yeah. chipmunk. Gray-footed? Gray-footed. It's mm -hmm. basically, you know, it's only found in the Sacramento Mountains and then down the Guadalupes because they're kind of contiguous, those that chain, all into the Guadalupes of, of Texas. So... You see your only Texas chipmunk on the way up to Guadalupe Peak. A little wildlife viewing yeah. tip for Very you. Very cool. They're really cool. skittish. Unlike chipmunks, if you're familiar with chipmunks back east, like the common they're eastern chipmunk, people they're and... super easy to see. Uh, these things are like nothing else. They're, they're, they're terrified of people. They're really hard to More see. More wild, right? They're super wild, but uh, they're skittish, man. So you got to really keep your, uh, you know, keep your wits about you. Yeah. And you can make if you're sense. not looking at the beautiful Permian rocks yeah. sure. beautiful yeah. what, what other, it's right there like, where there's um, too much plant coverage to see any rocks and then you can spend some time looking yeah. for well there's a, a lot of uh diversity in not only wildlife but also geology too so maybe we can do a quick spitfire session here you can talk about a little the wildlife sean and uh 
Why don't you talk about a little of the uh, geology that's out there? What kind of uh, can you find obsidian? Can you find no, uh, no, no? We're no we're talking we're talking sedimentary rocks. All so. sedimentary. Okay. Yeah. So so the great thing, as I mentioned before, that the the Guadalupe Mountains has to offer is it exposes rocks that are typically kind of buried thousands of feet beneath the surface in other places in Texas. Right. These are rocks that they're drilling for oil in the in the Permian Basin. Oh, okay. But in, no, no mafic, nothing like that. No, 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 no. We're not talking about igneous rocks. We're talking stuff that was that was laid down within a shallow seaway millions of years ago okay. in the Permian. So the cool thing about the the guads is. Um, imagine, okay, you have the shallow seaway. We've talked about the western interior before with the Cretaceous, but in the Permian, we had kind of a similar deal going. Uh, but we had a couple of different basins here in this region. So you have this, this big upthrown block where you have limestones that are accumulating in relatively shallow waters. And then you have the deep part of the basin where all of the fine grain sediments are being deposited. So at the Guads, you have kind of a, a, a replication of what that would have looked like topographically, um, well, topographically now bathymetrically in the Permian, where you have an upthrown faulted block of Permian rocks that are pushed up in a very similar position that the, the reef would have been way back 260 million years ago. So as you're driving into the Guads from the south, you see Guadalupe Peak and 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 uh, um, what's it called? El Capitan. El Capitan. There El you Capitan. go. Sorry, I had a had a brain fart there. El Capitan thrown up. You got to see El Capitan. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's I, I should have remembered what what it's called, but yeah. Um, it's, well, we can edit this. We can we can edit that so I sound smarter than I am. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. But it's, it's basically replicating the same kind of bathymetry or topography that you would have seen 260 million years ago during the Permian. So all of those big, thick limestones that form the peaks up in the Guadalupe Mountains would have been the edge of the reef during the Permian. And as you're down in the low country, you're driving through rocks that were deposited out in the basin and deposited as the basin was filling up with sediments. Yeah. So geologically speaking, it's probably one of the only places where you can walk through geologic time, at least in the Permian, and you can see all of these different different depositional environments preserved kind of like a like a layer cake or a book. Hmm. Well, uh, so wow, that that's pretty cool. That's pretty it's it's pretty cool. So, um what what about the fauna there, biology the and fauna so uh, you get some stuff there that's kind of uh more associated with the Rocky Mountains um, than the stuff you see around here. And, uh, you know, the Chisos Mountains kind of have more of this kind of Mexican Southern influence. And, sure. and there in the Guadalupes, you get a little of that, but then you get some some mammals that are kind of at the uh, Southern extreme of their range that are kind of more associated with the Rockies because they do, the Guadalupe is the influence, you know, the biological influence extends up into the Sacramento Mountains. And the Sacramento Mountains are more or less like kind of an outlier of the Rockies than they are of the Sierra Madres, like the Jesus Mountains are. So you get like uh, elk there that are more or less native there. No, the, probably the only place in Texas where well, we have elk here. Though. Yeah, but there, there, there's debate about this, and people talk about. But the elk that are in our part of the uh, West Texas mm -hmm. are escapes from game ranches. They were introduced. Oh, so they're more okay. Now I'm going to throw you a curveball though, because the elk in the Guadalupe's are also reintroduced so the the natural population that was there we know they were there naturally but that the subspecies that was there was hunted out a long time ago hmm. but elk were native there uh the the chipmunk is very unusual and cool there's a vole there that you what's know, a vole a vole is a small rodent that's you know kind of a, a mountain kind of rodent that likes to look like a rat around. like a mouse no they look way cooler than that they're kind of um short like a tribble like a little fur ball with a short tail so they don't have like a gross uh, long you know naked tail like a rat they've got a tiny little stubby tail tiny little ears kind of like a hamster yeah more like a hamster but okay. smaller and then uh there's old 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 record of um uh, grizzlies in the guadalupe oh, right. yeah which weren't 
ever formally documented there, but like a mammologist with good experience saw tracks there, like at the turn of the century. So there would have probably been grizzlies in the Guadalupe's historically, uh, probably just coming down from the Sacramento Mountains in New Mexico. But yeah, so it's kind of a cool kind of Rocky Mountain outlier right there at the border of New Mexico. Cool. So we would be amiss if we didn't talk about Big Bend National Park. You know, we talk about the National Park a lot, but I don't know that we've talked about specific trails. Right. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of yeah. our favorite yeah. hikes in the National gotta Park. Got to do the same thing, too. We've got to scale it. For, yeah. If you want to just do a short day hike, you know, well, the window okay. trail is kind of a <laughs> is kind of a classic one. Although people get in trouble in the windows trail, they 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 walk the window trail and it goes straight down for two miles, mm-hmm. and it's super easy because you're walking downhill <laughs> the whole way, and then they got to walk back. And yeah. that, so yeah. the window trail coming back, everybody hates it, but going down, it's really great, really easy, and I think it's super. It's it's not it's like, hard. Yeah, totally cool. But you know, some of the tourists out there, they're not exactly. accustomed to it, no. right? Right. And so we're us locals here. We're we're helping them. We're telling a uh, funny story. Uh, my dad, <laughs> my dad and I uh, went up to the Windows Trail, and uh, we we took some pictures and whatnot, and uh, we saw this. Uh, well, my dad on his phone had this picture really close. I mean, he's a professional photographer. Had a picture of a rattlesnake, mm-hmm. vicious looking snake, mm-hmm. close up, everything. And he was showing tourists like, hey, yeah. watch out. This is what we saw up there. Yeah. And they were yeah. like totally scared. And yeah. we kind of did it for kicks, but we, we like immediately <laughs> after told them, no, we're just joking. We're, we're locals. How can we help you? you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, let me use this to segue into what 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 is one of my favorite trails to recommend to people in the national park. And I've got a couple of I, I don't want to say novice trails, but they can be done by people who aren't in the best of shape. So one of those, which is up in the Chizos, is Lost Mine Trail. Yep. I yep. think Lost Mine Trail is the number one most popular trail in the park, and. That's not to say that, that you should stay away from Lost Mine Trail. If you go during a time when there's not a lot of tourists, it's a great hike. You may not see a single person. You may just see a couple of people. But in any case, um, you know what you're in for. It's not like the Windows Trail, like what Sean was talking about, where you're walking downhill for two miles, and then you got to turn around and, and hoof it back it's up. It's the other way around. You're going it's up. the other way around. Yeah. So with Lost Mine, you could get a third of the way up. You get halfway up. And you have really, really scenic views, and you've seen some cool geology, so that if you're totally exhausted, you can just turn around and walk back, and it's not going to destroy you. Mm-hmm. Um, and to get all the way up is not a huge deal either. It's two and a half miles. Yeah, um, very you, easy. Like, takes you, what, an hour and a half, two hours, something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think compared to the South Rim, which we can talk about here in a bit, the, the views that you get from the top of Lost Mine Trail are about the same as you would get from the South Rim. Okay. That's my wow. opinion. Wow, yeah. okay. Well, South uh, Rim. speaking of uh, mine trails, uh, what are your opinion? What, what's your opinion on Mariscal Mine? Oh, I, I love Mariscal Mine, but here, here's something we need to say about Mariscal Mine. Um, it's incredibly remote. So Yeah, oh, you need a good vehicle. You need a, you need a high clearance drive. vehicle. Yeah, yeah, and you need to let people know that you're going to be down there because Mariscal Mountain is probably one of the most remote areas in the national park. Even though you have the, 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 the river road that goes down there, it's still extremely remote, and it takes a few hours to get to Mariscal Mountain. Is it as hard to get to as uh, that Black Gap Road? Well, Black Gap extends north from from Mariscal. So if you go a short distance past Mariscal, then you take the Black Gap Road that that is four-wheel drive. Probably you need a a, a, a short wheelbase Jeep Wrangler to get up. But the River Road, if it's in good condition, you can get from from east to west or west to east. FJ Cruiser always. uh, always (laughs) Yeah, and a high-clearance vehicle, you're fine. But you need to let people know where you're going. And and Mariscal is one of my favorite places in the park. And uh, assuming you have a good, reliable vehicle and people know where you're going... um, you can get down there and the hike up to to the mine is nothing it's not even half a mile yeah so that that would be really 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 
low on the scale of, of that's of a great drive so too. for people who really like drive. like that four-wheel drive experience mm-hmm. right that could be a really cool one because the i've heard great things about the mariscal mine itself is super kind of you know uh, kind of a ghost town look really uh, old yeah. west kind of feel and so if you're really into four-wheel drive driving but not into hiking then it yeah. sounds like that could be your ticket because yeah, it's exactly. a half mile easy walk and you know that is one of the big draws of big bend national park it's not necessarily the hiking one big draw is that they have these really crazy roads set up for off-road enthusiasts and yeah. they have a, a campsite my cousin mm-hmm. and i uh we we of course use a gps a handheld like a g-trex uh garmin mm-hmm. a handheld gps battery operated it, it tell it gives us waypoints like we can know where we are and um yeah we we hiked for i mean we just really it wasn't even hiking we just walked yeah right for a few miles and uh found mariscal mine uh yeah. trail and stuff and so we're like hey cool all right yeah that's that's one thing we should mention you know assuming that the national park is opened up by the time this is airing um as the park becomes more and more popular i found that really all the campsites in the northern part of the park even extending down into the remote southern parts of the park are almost always uh, taken by people especially during the spring and the early part of the winter when it's really popular so um, if you have a, a high clearance vehicle and you're just packing up and you want to come down here to Big Bend and see what you can find uh, the campsite at Mariscal Dominguez Glen Springs these might these might be the only sites that are available yeah, um, which is not is a bad thing because sure. like you said Conley they are they're great campsites and and this is one of the one of the places or a few of the places i've been trying to convince honor bond to go out with this because there's not a single place in the park where you can go and see such magnificent night skies because it's way down in the southern part of the park and even if you're not hiking even if you're not going on a 15 mile trail if you're camped out there and you go out at 10 o'clock at night the stars look like a dome it's, oh yeah it's incredible sure. yeah well you can get if you're in glen springs right you can get a little glimpse of uh that Me- uh, town in mexico across the border yeah. what, what is that town Montanus? san vicente boquillas san vicente san vicente no, there would be san vicente yeah okay all right yeah from glen springs mm-hmm. uh like two or three yeah or something like that yeah but, but. It, let, let's get back to, to trails. You know, the, the Chizos, that's the number one place people go, the Chizos Mountains, to go hiking. And you have some good variety of places there. You've got, you've got the Window, which is considered kind of a moderate trail. You have Lost Mine, which is pretty moderate. And then you have the South Rim, which is a full day hike. And... Um, Again, if you're prepared, you can make it up there, yeah. and you can even make it up to, to Emory Peak. I think you need to be in pretty good shape to go all the way up to South Rim for for a day. That's that's a commitment. It's t- totally worth it, though. I I, I think that um, the views from the South Rim are comparable to the great kind of great views of the Lost Mine Trail, well, but the cliffs of yeah. of the South Rim are unbelievable. Well, but, for photography purposes, you want to go later in the day, yeah, when the sun is yeah. on the other side, yeah. right? Yeah, so it can illuminate those beautiful yeah. those beautiful cliffs. I've, camping out there overnight that's that's something like for the backpackers. It's that was my number one recommendation for anybody who wants like a who's a little bit experienced. Got a little, you've done some overnight backpacking. Um, you got to get up and just actually camp out on the south rim right do do an overnight and spend the and then everybody's gone at the end of the evening you know there's just, just you and a, maybe a couple other backpackers mm. and you can watch the sunset from there oh yeah uh, you can just sure. sit on one of those rocks that's amazing that's yeah. that's something that uh, is totally worth doing and you know yeah. one of you know, I, I can never forget the couple times i did it when i was much younger yeah yeah Very nice. and you're you're a mile hike from the south rim up to emory peak which is yeah, one of the mm-hmm. highest peaks in texas which is a doozy of a hike yeah that that that's probably one of the toughest miles that you can do especially after doing the whole way up to the south rim but yeah. not to mention it's very repetitive it's like you're going in a spiral the whole time like you're yeah. going left Seeing and then you're going peaks. right and then you get you're the same going thing left Guadalupe. And right. there's all these false peaks you're like oh this is it and then, no, <laughs> no, no it's it not keeps going. but when and you, if you're tired and you're doing that you're like, oh, God, yeah, no yeah. way. 
But you make it up to the top and you have a full oh, yes. 360 view Absolutely of beautiful. all of Big Ben. I hate basically. the weather station up there. I got to be honest with you. I think. Uh, <laughs> is honor bond uh, honor bond you okay are you digging a hole in your garage weather station i don't like the weather station on top of emory peak i kind of wish they'd get rid of it yeah it's this big uh you know wires yeah. and this antenna and all this garbage and it kind of takes away from the experience so uh yeah. yeah otherwise you can get a full 360 view yes now so outside of the Chizos, everyone everyone who visits Big Bend, they they go out to the Chizos and, and go on a couple of hikes. And I'm I'm showing my preference here, but it's all igneous rock. So mm -hmm. if you really want to see the interesting geology, you gotta go down into the low desert. That's my opinion. Oh, right. oh and, really? Yeah. When we come back from oh, the man. break, I'll spend the last or we'll spend the last ten minutes talking about some of the cool hikes we can do outside of the Chizos in the National Park that people might not be so familiar with. Yeah, I mean, I, and, and then you're getting into the Badlands and the Cretaceous stuff, Yeah, the right? good stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, let's do it. See you after the break. Hey, everybody. Sean Graham here. Science Nights in the Morning, and we're still talking about hiking. And Thomas Schiller was about to take us down into the low desert, into the Badlands, where the cool sedimentary rocks are. Yeah. And a trail down there where maybe you can see some of the places where where we've discovered things like dinosaurs. That's right. I like to call them the good lands. The good lands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so the really scenic, or at least what most people consider scenic uh, regions of Big Bend are up in the Chizos Mountains. So I'm going to make some recommendations of hikes that you can do down in the low country, what we call the low desert. So if you're out there in Big Bend for the first time, the number one thing that you need to do is you need to drive down uh, Old Maverick Road and come up Ross Maxwell Scenic Drive. Um, there are a number of reasons for this. One, it's incredibly scenic, which you could imagine from the name. But uh, Ross Maxwell, who was the first superintendent of Big Bend National Park, was a geologist. So the Ross Maxwell Scenic Drive actually drives through all of or most of the geologically significant regions of western Big Bend. So here's my recommendation for folks. If you have a vehicle that, that has pretty good clearance, I'm not going to say four-wheel drive only because if it's under good conditions, you can make it down Old Maverick Road. But if you come into the park on the west side through Studio Butte, you can immediately as you get into the park hit um, Old Maverick Road, which goes south. And this is the number one way of, of really introducing yourself to Big Bend because you go from a paved road straight to a dirt road. And you start driving south down through the, the Badlands. Now, um, there aren't too many trails that extend from, from Old Maverick Road. But as you drive down, you'll see all of these kind of variegated uh, or banded rocks off to either side that are Cretaceous rocks. These are rocks that have dinosaur bones in them. Really colorful. Yeah, really colorful purples and yellows and grays. And as you continue down, you get into some of the, the older Cretaceous rocks. And then you'll get to um, the Chimneys Trail. Okay, this is the first trail I've got for you. So the Chimneys Trail is like a seven and a half mile trail that extends all the way from Old Maverick Road to, to Ross Maxwell Road. You can hike that whole thing and hike back. You can have someone pick you up on the other side. But if you just want a short hike, you can hike maybe a mile or two down that trail, and Sean has done this with me, and you're hiking through some really interesting geology. You're hiking through the Aguja Formation, which is a dinosaur-bearing unit, but you're also seeing rocks that were deposited within a really unique setting geologically. These are rocks that were deposited within a what's called a Mar Crater. So a crater that formed back in the Cretaceous where magma came up and erupted into a body of water, essentially, and formed a big crater. And then that crater filled in with sediments, including limestone. And as you can imagine, this is a really unique setting. You don't see this a lot. So as you walk down the Chimneys Trail, you can see this stuff. Okay, And maybe you'll see a dinosaur bone or, or something like that. Don't pick it up, but you can look at it. You can see it. Um, within the Aguja Formation. What would they have to do if they did see one? Um, so 
you should if you see something that's significant, you should report that's it right. to a ranger. Um, the ranger will go out and check it out. If it's something that needs to be excavated, they'll contact someone like me. But just appreciate it. Don't pick it up. Don't mess with it. Don't take it home. That's totally so, illegal. So Th- Thomas, when you said about craters, like this one is from an explosion that happened underwater, right? So for a person who is hiking around, like they see a crater, how would they know if it's a crater made by an asteroid or if it's a crater made by... Uh, like this kind of explosion, are there any differences? Like, with, well, like, there there are, and and, and uh, I won't talk about those. But the cool thing about this okay. this Mark crater is you can't really see it um, oh, unless yeah. you look closely. Yeah. I was actually going to mention that I, I've seen this area, and you can't just tell with your naked eye looking at it. The story that he just told. You have to be a trained geologist. Uh, it's over overgrown. Yeah, it's it's eroded and and it's right. like it doesn't look like a crater. It's it you know it's a cool geological feature, but I couldn't tell what I was looking at. Um, right. Thomas yeah. was explaining to me. I was like, uh huh, okay, it just like a big, <laughs> a big desert hill to me. Yeah. yeah. The about the best you can do is as you're walking down the chimneys trail, you can see off to your right, you can see rocks that are dipping. So the beds are dipping in all these different directions. That kind of indicates that they were deposited in a in a crater. So it takes a little bit of, of walking around to figure it out. But the cool thing about there is 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 you're looking at a place that's really unique. Um, you don't see this environment or this this type of setting in many other places. And it's one of the pieces of evidence that we have of volcanism or volcanoes erupting during the Cretaceous. Okay, so after you've checked that out, um, you can continue down uh, Old Maverick Road and make your way to Santa Atlantic Canyon. The whole time you're going down Old Maverick, you're going to see all sorts of Cretaceous rocks, all sorts of dinosaur-bearing rocks. And then you get to Santa Elena Canyon where you have this big majestic cliff that's being brought up along a fault. So you're basically seeing where where you have over a thousand feet of rock that have been brought up, displaced along a fracture, along a fault. And one of the best, I would say the next most popular, if not as popular hikes in the park as, as Lost Mine Trail is the, is the Santa Elena Canyon hike, which is maybe half a mile at most, not even that. And if Terlingua Creek is low, you can walk across and you can walk a short distance into the canyon. And you really kind of, even if there are a lot of people there, you you become pretty isolated because you go back into the canyon. And geologically speaking, you can see these sheer cliffs that expose ancient Cretaceous limestones that are older than the rocks that have dinosaurs in them. So um, geologically, that's cool. Uh, biologically, I've, I've probably been in there, I don't know, 20 different times. Um, one of the things I've noticed is it's a good place to see some of the invasive species that, that, oh, yeah. that exist along the Rio Grande. Yeah. Like Are you talking about in the water? In the, yeah, the, the, the stuff that occurs along the, the river, like yeah. tamarisk and, mm-hmm. and river Well, you cane. can wade. You can wade out in the river. Yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and there's one part where you actually have to wade in order to get across and yeah if they're, they they're uh, like what creek is up you got to wade across mm-hmm. or you got to somehow figure out a way to go all the way up and around it and that's kind of it's a cool one because it throws you a curveball and, and it's and and just average tourists have to kind of figure out how to do this you know like what are we doing here and yeah. they get they get real muddy you know and they got to oh, take yeah. the shoes yeah, off yeah, you get really dirty cool. they roll up them denims yeah santa elena is cool it's got a lot of um some of the best fish diversity in the rio grande is just downstream from so that area where you can wade around those riffles there yeah. have uh, some of the really good intact Rio Grande fish stuff is there. There were sightings of sturgeon at uh, Santa Elena Canyon in wow. like the 1950s. Mm. That, that that late, they were still coming up the Rio Grande. Wow. Um, they you know they go upstream to spawn, or they did before the big hydroelectric dams yeah. went in. And you can see so, Mexico. You can look across oh, yeah. Mexico, and a lot of people go over there. You're not supposed to, yeah. but uh, I've seen a lot of people get away with it. Hmm. Okay, so Santa Elena, you want to continue up to to Ross Maxwell Scenic Drive. You can go down to Castellone. I think they have a, a temporary store open there now, so you can go and get refreshments, get an ice cream cone or whatever. 
and continue up Ross Maxwell Scenic Drive. Now, as I said before, Ross Maxwell was a geologist. He was the first superintendent. So that section of the road goes through some incredible geology and incredible scenery. Didn't Ross it, Maxwell design the road? He, he designed he, it, yeah. To, so he it said would take you, you to, to all these cool geological spots. I think yeah. that's, oh, that's so great. neat. It's the only yeah. national park I really know about that's that's got a road like that, mm. where like a superintendent who knew stuff designed the road. It's yeah. really it's and it paid so off. Cool, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It paid off because um, unlike the old Maverick Road, where there are just a handful of trails that you can hike from there. On Ross Maxwell, there are a number of short hikes that you can take. So um, there are a few really long, strenuous hikes that link up to Ross Maxwell, but let's talk about the ones that you can do in a day, okay? So heading north on Ross Maxwell, you've done half the loop. The first place you want to stop is a place called Tough Canyon. Okay, this isn't Cretaceous rocks. I'm getting out of my out of my realm here, but we're talking about uh, rocks that were formed during, uh, let's say, a period of, of around 38 to 32 million years ago, that were erupted from volcanoes. You know, during that time, this whole area was covered in volcanoes that were constantly erupting. So Tough Canyon basically has a trail where you can walk down and you can see these rocks that were erupted out of the vent of a volcano. Okay, um, and as you walk down through the canyon, even when it's tourist season, I've found this is a place where you can walk just a couple of hundred yards from the road and you still might not see anyone because they don't really know that they can walk down in there. But there's an established trail that goes into the canyon. Um, so you can walk down there and you can see all of these igneous features. Um, and then you can see a really cool fault, another fault that brings up older igneous rocks. Um, and it's kind of a cool place that has little Tanahas you can climb around and, and play and, around in there. And it's, it's tough. It's T-U-F-F, T-U-F-F. which is uh, a type of rock. It's not right. like as in it's hard or it's T-U-F-F. Yeah, it's basically consolidated ash. ash. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's ash that's it's been snow consolidated. White. In fact, when you're driving down there at night, sometimes you see that tuff and yeah. it looks like there's snow on the ground. Yeah. It's so neat. And you're like, oh, but yeah. The, hi- the, the hike is really it's easy. It's, it, the hike is really easy. It's not It's not tough. Right. Yeah. Sean, Sean loves puns. <laughs> Play on words. Yeah. I'm so confused. All right. Let's kidding. let's jump back in the car. We're, we're heading back north. Okay. The next place you want to stop is Lower Burrow Mesa Trail. So the tuff that you saw down in Tuff Canyon uh, at Burrow Mesa, at the Lower Burrow Mesa Trail, now comprises the high part of a big cliff face through which a couple of waterfalls are cutting. So at, at Lower Burrow Mesa... Again, the hike is less than half a mile. You get down into a creek, and you walk up a short distance. And in these brilliant cliffs, you can see these these igneous rocks preserved. You have a lava flow that's preserved, and then you have a tuff that's preserved. And you can see it all where it's been eroded within the past maybe few hundred years. And then it ends up at this beautiful pour-off, this really sheer cliff where a waterfall, if it's raining, will pour down. And this is another one of these places that not a lot of people visit. So if there are a lot of tourists, you can hike down there and not see a single person. So another great place to see the geology. Okay. I hope you're going to say the Mule Ears Trail. Mule Ears Trail is... Gotta check that out. Yeah, just nearby. It's such a cool little feature. Yeah, you can pull off at Mule Ears. Nice little trail. Yeah, and you can hike out and you can can see Mule Ears, which are, are a series of dikes. So igneous intrusions where magma has forced its way up through the through the surrounding rock and where it's eroded, it forms these kind of blade-like features. In the case of mule ears, it forms two features that look a lot like the ears of, of a mule, right? It's well um, named. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It looks like mule ears. You can see them from everywhere around. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so you, see them on post, you see them on a lot of postcards. Yeah. If you stop in Terralingua or Studio Butte, they all have mule ears mm-hmm. on them, right? So, um, yeah, let's let's continue going north. We've got about two minutes. So, so as you're driving north, um, you're going to see more igneous rocks. And there's one place you can stop. If you've been down to Lower Borough Mesa, you can hike to Upper Borough Mesa, which is a little bit of a longer trail that takes you to the top of the pour-off that you would have mm. seen at Borough Mesa. So you basically walk up through the same rocks, and then you walk up to, base, to, to a sheer cliff where you can see down to where you were earlier in the day, which is pretty cool. Um, so continuing north, um, as you drive northward, 
there are more exposures of the Cretaceous rocks that you would have seen as you drove down Old Maverick Road. So you start to see more of these color banded rocks. You see purples and yellows and all these badlands that are forming out in the distance. So you're getting into the dinosaur territory at that point. So um, you can really get a good view of that stuff. Um, and then you link up with the, the main park road, right? And you can take that park road east, go up to the Chizos, or you can take it back, back west if you're staying in Terlingua. Um, and that's one of the cool things great about... Great loop. Sounds like a great... Yeah, it's a full awesome day. If you take your time, loop. you can do that full loop and, and complete it in a day. And there are all sorts of little hikes that you can take. Um, all of them really are... are or beginner hikes they're not they're not yeah. too intense if you want intense hikes like we talked about before you can go up in the chizos and all of these you would do like you could do them in the winter time and mm -hmm. it would be super it would be a beautiful day nine times out of ten 65 degrees probably yeah ne not necessarily cold maybe if it was cold even better yeah but it, you wouldn't burn up and we have we have what like a minute left conley i yeah, know we yeah. promised we talk about preparing for these hikes um, well you know what that would be good <laughs> You're on for your own, another people. episode yeah. we're talking about <laughs> Uh, maybe on our next episode we can talk well, let, about let me let me let me bit. let me give one word if we've got enough time water water okay good yeah water please of water. take Talking water about, with uh, you dihydrogen monoxide yeah. more more water than you think you need yeah take if you're gonna go you. on a hike even if it's just a mile take enough water with yeah. you because a lot of people die out in Big Bend by not taking enough water so please be sure if you're going to hike any of these trails that we've suggested take enough water with you all right not yeah. not a can of soda too much water take too you much you can't water download too. an app and like have water from it. <laughs> no <laughs> no i'm sorry <laughs> for all no those water. tourists out there uh, that are coming in uh, <laughs> there's no way to do that but uh honor bond any closing thoughts any closing statements man oh no i oh, no, I was just going to say, as I was trying to jump in and say, take a pair of binoculars with you. And that's about it. <laughs> oh, but, oh, yeah. That astral. To... Astral uh, binoculars. Yeah. <laughs> not, not just astral, but just take a pair of binoculars. It will give you a better view even during the day. There are things you might want to see. Yeah, and birds stuff, so and geologic features have... and everything. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, I can tell you one thing right now. It is a spiritual experience whenever you go out there at night and you see the vast majority of the galaxy and it makes you really kind of uh, reattune to yourself spiritually uh, at least it does for me yeah really we're, we're gonna we're gonna drag honor bond down there one time and yeah see if he has that hey we should do a live show experience. with honor bond at yeah. night yeah, cool. yeah. <laughs> we should all right yes beam it live yeah yep. all right Spikes. everyone beam thank you up. for thank you for joining us we are the science knights we'll catch you next weekend 10 a.m kvlf y'all have a good weekend Thanks for listening to this episode of Science Nights in the Morning. Be sure and follow us on Patreon for exclusive gear and uncut episodes. Check out the latest science articles on our Facebook page and subscribe to us on YouTube and your favorite podcast listening app. You can also listen every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time at BigBenRadio.com. And if you got a question, we'll join the discussion. Hit the hotline at 432-217-1983 and record your message. We couldn't do this without you, and thank you so much for listening each and every week. That's Science Nights in the Morning with a K, and we'll see you next time.